are uh, interested in reaching out to people beyond the gun community, beyond the uh, the echo chamber, if you will, or welcoming new people in. So Christopher Dover is one of those people, and he is here. You know him as Clover Tack, and uh, you've seen us do lives together. Um, his channel, uh, Ghost Tactical Channel, we've been on together a lot. Um, we've done a bunch of different things, uh, cross paths a lot, um, some collaborations, I guess, in a loose way. Uh, but we are friends, and I know him to be interested in this topic. So, uh, Christopher, welcome. If you'll let everybody know uh, kind of what, what you're up to in general, and then I'll get into exactly what we're going to do here for about 30 minutes. Well, I'm not quite as busy of a man as you, but I stay pretty busy. So that's that's a lot. A uh, little backstory: There may be some that, that don't know. Um, lifelong firearm owner, obviously. Come from a youth shooting sports coach and instructor background, really heavily with all of that. Uh, work YouTube, social media, you know, those type of things, more informational videos, and help out the same way that we help out with the YouTubers and whatever. Uh, most of us are really interested in, in helping the industry side of things, the firearm industry, but we have an opportunity as well to help promote. I consider myself an, an advocate, not an activist, um, and so one thing I can do as social influencer, YouTuber, that sort of thing is is have conversations with some of those folks that I really think are activists. They're really doing some of the work in the 2A community just to help further their message. They're a little bit better. I know you want to talk a little bit about communication uh, and some things like that. And I think that's key, right? There's some of the folks out there that are way better at that 2A message, I think, than I am. And I think I can be more affected by promoting and advancing and increasing the reach of those people rather than trying to kind of venture out on my own. They're already doing good work, right? Yeah, that makes sense. And, and you do that. I see you I see you helping other people spread their message a lot. So right now for about 30 minutes, what we're going to do is uh, talk about a couple of different things. Sometimes there's some tangents that are closely related. The, the big theme here is speaking with people outside of the gun community, right? And I think that to me is what defines an advocate as opposed to someone who's like an enthusiast, right? Or even an influencer of the shooting community or the gun community, or the gun industry, whatever you want to call it, your audience. Right. But more importantly, talking to people outside of, you know, what I guess is pejoratively known as the echo chamber. Um, but at the very least, um, when we're going to talk to people, if you're an advocate, when you're talking to people inside the gun community, Hopefully you're doing exactly what you just said, which is helping them be more effective and influential outside of the community. And then a very closely related topic, especially this year, is all of the new people who have come into the, the gun community who may not have been inclined to join it, um, you know, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, whatever it may have been. So they may have a little different flavor and a little different ear for hearing about things uh, than someone who's a, who's a diehard. I know you and I are diehards, right? That goes without uh, without question. I think that we are uh, unabashedly pop, uh, um, uh, proud of our relationship with the Second Amendment and the gun community. But that's not true for everybody. Where do you want to start? What, what, what's more? What's more well, interesting you to begin? Is it the the people outside the community or the new people coming into the community? Well, it's. I think we back up and we we say we caveat that by saying that there's a litany of reasons for which somebody might not be externally proud of that, right? Maybe it, it deals with their job, their family situation. There there can be a whole host of reasons, right? Um, and so a lot of times that's where we have to be careful, I think, with communication is because people may be outly portraying that they're they're not firearm owners or they're not, you know, interested in the two A or something like that. But until you get to know them, until you actually have a conversation with them on a different level, right? And then they understand that you're not somebody that can cost them their job or cost them. I mean, people relate, especially with cancel culture nowadays, right? People relate uh, with, you know, somebody going off the rails. And you, all you did is have a conversation out in the grocery store or on the street. They found out you're a firearm owner. They happen to know where you work. They know that your boss is anti-gun. Now they've called and reported you to your boss, right? And you've lost your job because some kind of virtue signaling that they feel they're doing the right thing by costing you your job because you carry it's, a firearm, you know? It's almost like, have you, you know how I've been um, putting out stories on Instagram, I don't know if you've seen it, where I'm like, if you hacked my comms, and then I put out like funny conversations I've had with somebody, mm -hmm. have you actually been hacking my comms? No. Okay, because, because literally, immediately when we are done with this, uh, which is why we really are gonna stick to maybe 30, 40 minutes today, um, I have to jump on a call to have a conversation about this very thing because there's some people 
who want to be part of an event, but the static is like, well, but I don't want to use my name. And this event explicitly is about like gun ownership, pride and fun and enthusiasm and like that. So for me, there's a huge conflict of interest. And one of the things that got raised was, well, some of these people are like afraid they might lose their job. So I, I said, you know, I've heard this like over the years off and on, except when I like Google lost job because of gun, I, like 2014, there was somebody who claimed, like, who sued okay. somebody, right? Um, te Texas right. Law Shield uh, from a legal standard, like, we'll defend you if someone tries to fire. But honestly, I just don't see it. So, so it's interesting that you went there because this is something else that people are talking about today. Let's go there um, because I want to talk about then well, how tolerant you should be. Okay. Well, first of all, you've got a difference between, um, you know, union states, right to work states. There are a lot of, of things. And I had a conversation with my father actually a couple of days ago. Um, it had to do with the weather here in Texas, and there's some bosses that, I mean, we're dealing with historic weather we normally don't get. You know, how do you get to work? If you're, my wife is an essential employee, right? How does she get to work? And what are the ramifications if she can't? Because it's, it's a dire situation for, she works in the prison system, dire situation when she's not there, right? Um, so I was having this conversation with my dad, and it's like the roads are treacherous. How do you get to work? How do you manage all of this? Um, and you know, if she doesn't go, you know, go to work. What happens when they fire because she doesn't show up to work? Even though a reasonable person would say that's a valid reason, right? Well, here's the thing: they don't have to fire you for that. So if you Google what you're talking about, that's that's all good and well and great, but we don't know that the reason that they said they fired them was the reason that they actually fired them. You feel me? You could, in a right to work, you Maybe, can kind of make up any but, reason. You could go back. It could be, it could be six months after the fact, after they fi find that out and they don't okay, like it, and they're just waiting for you to screw up. Are you suggesting that we, uh, as a community, should be tolerant of the, the unsubstantiated, not objectively provable claim that someone doesn't want to be a gun owner because their boss might fire them. I, don't, I can't get there. I don't think we need to be tolerant of that, but I think that we need to recognize that that is a possibility. And for that particular individual, whether it's, it's founded, whether it's reasonable or not, a lot of people, we, talk, we often talk about emotion, and we go, oh, the other side, they run on emotion. Emotion is a real thing, right? Now, whether it's justified whether it's the emotion is founded in any type of factual basis we can have that debate that's fine but there's no debate that emotion is a real thing and that person feels a certain way right okay, so so, I, so now so now i'm with you now i'm I'm, a, I, I'm aligned on being sensitive to their feelings right right so so how does that manifest itself because this is something we haven't talked about with anybody else there's a difference between somebody saying like I don't want to be associated with, with that kind of behavior that I see from the gun community. And then we can say, okay, we get that, or, or we don't like it either. Or, well, you, maybe you misunderstand it. You need to like, that black rifle isn't a, a dangerous thing. It's a fun mm -hmm. thing. And we could talk about it. This is somebody's feeling. So their perception is that if they, you know, come out of the closet as a gun owner, right? And I always talk about this. I, I think I've talked about it in two or three of these already. Like when I'm at the dinner party, and somebody right. doesn't want it. Like they look around and they're like, "Hey, hey, I was thinking about buying a gun," you know. And, they, <laughs> and I'm like, "I don't, I don't go. Oh, you want to buy a gun, huh? Right in front of, and out them in right. front of everybody, yeah. because of their perception. So that's right. what you're talking about is their perception. So how do you then um, tell that you, you got a person same thing? I want to get a gun, but man, how, how am I going to deal with the idea that I'm going to buy a gun and I'm afraid I'm going to get fired? Without saying you'll never get fired, that's dumb. How mm -hmm. do you then? kind of walk them through that next step well i you know it, it, i guess you get into how you know you get into the conversation of where they work you know are they are they then looking to further that not just get the firearm but are they going to get a license to carry right and then are they able to actually carry at work if they're able to actually carry at work and there's no policy then odds are there's not it's an unfounded problem right? i mean an unfounded there's not a reason for it you know what i mean it's it's it, like again, it's it's unreasonable. Their emotions are kind of unreasonable. So getting it across to them in that way, but but I guess maybe normalization probably is the easiest way to go about that. Um, is to make them feel instead of them feeling ostracized because they feel that oh I'm in this unique special situation right and I'm alone in this that you're not alone. You know I understand 
what you're saying. And that's, that's a lot of times. Whether I can sympathize or empathize with that, that may be totally different. But it's like I hear you. I understand what you're saying. And I'm a big proponent. You know, I always say God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Um, and I think that I think in any form of communication, I think a lot of times we don't listen enough and we don't listen properly, right? We tend to turn things off when somebody uses a certain word. And I think that's, that's rough. We've got to get over that and we've got to get through the entire conversation and listen to everything they've said and then figure out, okay, it was emphasis on that word I didn't like. Right, so if somebody's talking. We get hung up when they say assault rifle because we go, oh, there's no such thing as a. Right. Well, okay, what was the context of the, of the conversation and jumping in and preempting that as soon as they say assault rifle and go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, and stopping them and stop their train of thought, you know, and it's 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 potentially damaged the conversation. Where if you would have heard them out, then you would have known the context and then you could have tried to address that on the back end a little later on, right? Yeah, so, so I get that. So the idea, so I think kind of that's what happened, right? So you talked about, well, what if somebody's afraid of getting fired? And I go right to you, well, that's not, that's not even real. And your point being not how to keep them from getting fired, but how to keep, get them comfortable with it. So one of the ways would obviously then be what you're saying, I think, is I've, I know a lot of people who feel that way who are not, they don't have the NRA sticker on the back of their car. They don't wear the gun shirts. I mean, I very rarely do that kind of stuff. Now, granted, yeah. I drive around the country quite often in a car that's covered up with logos, but – right. I don't wear, you know, the the gun shirts and stuff like that. Well, today's a special a special day for me normally, but you know. <laughs> so so it's so it's it's when when we look at the, the way we make people more comfortable, the idea that they are not unique in mm -hmm. not wanting to be uh, like out, if you will, gun owners. Now, there, I think there's a difference between well, or, or the, not just that, not just that, Rob, but it's not that. It's not that they want, don't want to be out, but, I mean, there is lots of people that are firearm owners that you, you never know, right? It's not a thing. I mean, I know people that, let's take the word that everybody's going to use is FUD, right? But let's take that person that the only time they break out their firearms is to go hunting, right? That's it. And unless you see them in the deer woods, right, for some right. strange reason, you would never know they were a firearm owner, right? It's just not a thing. They don't talk about it. So I think reinforcing that, that you can be a gun owner, right, and and not be at the level of advocacy or awareness or promotion or whatever, and that's fine. Because to me, that's all a progression. You talk about the new people coming in. What's exciting to me about the new people coming in, and I don't want to jump around subjects too crazy here, but, you know, where are the future advocates and activists, right? out of those millions of new gun owners. There's got to be some. You know there are. You know there's some that have taken that progression. They felt they needed it. They got it. It's fun. Oh, wait. Look at this controversy. Man, I've got an inalienable right here that I need to protect. And they educate themselves and they move on. And wow, what an ally that is because those people are coming from a totally different mindset being new gun owners coming aboard in 2020. I mean, as opposed to us, right, who have been lifelong firearm owners. So what yeah. an asset that's going to be, right? And so, it, again, they're going to be able to speak to, once they achieve that level up into advocacy and, and activism, they're going to be able to speak to people on levels you and I only dream about speaking on because they can relate. Because they had that experience. Sure. Well, just uh, Rhonda Marie, Rhonda Mary was on our, our uh, series here just before you. And she's only been in the game for, for a couple few years as a gun owner. And even mm -hmm. just prior to that was someone who um, didn't want to be around. She talked about how one of her boyfriends had a gun. She didn't want to. She was like, keep it away <laughs> from me. When I come over. And then um, I, I think of uh, jo Johanna over uh, at Latinos Locked and Loaded, Locked and Loaded Latinos at the podcast. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, her and Rolo. Rolo was into it and, and kind of out as a gun owner. And she was very much like, oh, I don't want to talk about this in front of my family. I want to talk about it in front of my work. And then she came to the 2A rally in 2019 and was like, oh, I got to break this open. And now she's out in public and they have their own podcast and all that. So, right. so, so let's go there. Now we'll go, well, let's go into the new gun owner. So how do we then, mm -hmm. knowing these things are real, right? And having personally experienced them and having friends now who are advocates who might have looked at us like, how, how come they're so into guns five years ago? Or even two years ago. But right, yeah. or even two years ago. How do we deal with the fact that when people come into the gun community, let's forget about the job thing or forget about the, the not sure. wanting to talk about it. They're just, they're just, maybe they're coming in and saying, you know what? 
that I get having a pistol because I want to have this pistol to defend myself, but I don't mm -hmm. know about ARs. Like, do, right. we, do we just then, what do, do we slap them in the face or do we just say, oh, yeah, that's cool. You, I'm glad you're here. No, I mean, I, I think it's like, I think it's just like anything else. I mean, you can, you can overwhelm and inundate somebody, right? And I think that new people coming in, we've got to be careful. Uh, and we, we talked about this with the, the issue. It's no secret, you know, that, that what we've been doing with on the YouTube side of things. But context matters, right? Yeah. And so if we come in um, like we're talking, like I'm talking to you. I can have a totally different conversation with you. You know what a bolt action is. You know how it works, a lever action. You know the difference between rim fire and center fire. You know the difference between magnum calibers. You, you know all of this, right? I can't have that conversation with a new person. I'm going to overwhelm them, right? So it's being able to pick up real quickly and understand, again, through listening, you're able to tell pretty quickly. You're able to tell how hip, right, that person is to, what, to what's going on, right? You can, you can sort of gauge where they're at on that, you know, scale of, of knowledge when it comes to firearms, right? And then just, just walk them through it. I mean, if they don't know, they don't know what they don't know, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's an opportunity for us to, to slowly walk them walk them through so, that right so but let's talk about how slowly we can go right because there are some mm -hmm. people who like there's a there's a thing going around the internet right now with well i want quality over quantity in other words i don't uh -huh. i don't care about six million new gun owners or three million new gun owners i want 30 million of the hundred to go away because they're fuds as we say you know they're they're they're, they're people that aren't really you know they're second amendment but and i say second amendment but is way better than anti-gun so if someone says, I'm only interested in pistols, don't even talk to me about ARs, there are, mm -hmm. there's a component of our culture right now that would say, well, then you need to go away, right? And then there's another component of our culture, which I think, which I know I'm in, and I'm asking you, that says, that's cool. I'm glad you're into pistols. Let's, let's, let's go from there. Yep. And I just, I don't I'm, care. I'm going yeah. to move forward. Yeah, I don't care. Uh, and that's all part of the, the, the FUD life concept and some of the stuff I, I've been uh, playing around with and running with is, you know, it started out with, oh, this guy only hunts two or three times a year. He don't care about nothing else. Well, we've moved into a place that there are people that only care about the handgun in their nightstand, people that only care about the AR-15 that they take to the range. That's all they care about, right? Yeah. So they're not looking into hunting rights. They're not looking into range rights and ranges that are being sued by. They don't pay attention to that. They don't care. And that's an infringement the same as anything else, right? So we need to be cognizant of all the different moving parts and pieces, right? And how somebody can exercise and enjoy their Second Amendment rights, right? And that's what it boils down to. And just like we can have a difference in opinion on the cars we like or the food we eat, we can have a difference in opinion on the type of firearms we utilize and what we utilize them for as long as they're being used for legal purposes. Now, one thing we need to stay unified on is, you know, violence and illegal means and, and things like that. But... um yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's the route we go to answer your question about uh, the quantity er, over quality. You have to have quantity. Yeah. When with the political, I, I, I with a with a democratic republic, with a little bit of socialism, I guess at this point probably mixed in. Um, but you have to have numbers, right? And even though those, even though those, let's call them FUD or the lack of day people or the the whatever fair weather fans. Um, that you've got, they at least bolster those numbers on paper. And then if you've got a significant number of people that are activists and advocates and active, right, that can point to that and go, look, the shooting sports community is X number thousand or millions of people strong. The hunting community is X number thousands of people strong, right? Then that's the, that's the broader tent. But they're not going to go. Nobody's going to go to each individual person out there, right? Nobody goes and and tries to poll every NRA member. Nobody goes out and tries to poll, you know what I mean? Anybody that's into any different different facet, there's the, that's the reason organizations exist. You sign on to this, and then a smaller group of people, the board of directors or whatever it might be, and representatives, they go speak on the behalf, right? So we, we want the quality, definitely, because we want that upper echelon that's good at communication from, from various perspectives and levels that's good as communication. We don't need a homogenous message. I think that's very dangerous. But we want that, and then, but we do need those, those people. Now, as we move along, do we need to try to poke and prod and get those people to understand that may, they, while they may not care about over-under shotguns or they may not care about AR-15s or they may not care about revolvers, they may not care about whatever, 
that it's important that they don't lose sight of there's still a inalienable right to which you should be able to own and possess those things, right? Okay, so that's so that's that's where I wanted to go. So I'm glad you got there because um, just for everybody that's watching, we probably got about nine ten minutes left. So if you have any questions, you know, throw them in there. Uh, I'll try to try to read some of them if they're they're on topic that we're, we're address, on the topic we're addressing. So let me ask you this, Christopher. We got a very I think very stark difference between somebody who says, I don't care about AR-15s, I just, I'm just glad I have this pistol in my nightstand, or I don't care about anything like that, I just want to go hunting, and somebody who says, I love the Second Amendment, I love guns, I'm so glad I have this gun that I can use to defend myself, I'm so glad I have this rifle I can hunt with, but I don't see any reason somebody needs a 30-round magazine clip capacity mm -hmm. ghost mag thingy thing. Right. Right? Where, yep. To me, this is the same exact thing. It's just they're further behind the curve, and we just got to get them closer. Other right. people would say, no, they are for any restrictions whatsoever. They can't be part of our team. Yep. Well, well that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a problem is that's all perspective. It's all perspective. What, what you're gonna, where you're going to draw that line is going to be different than where I'm going to draw the line, where Maj draws the line, where KD draws the line, where, you know, whoever, right? Pick somebody, right? Um Everybody that, that draws that line, and that's the problem, is people people tend to go the all-or-nothing route, right? Yes. So, And they go the all-or-nothing route because that's really the only logical line you can draw. I, under, I understand why people do that. I don't think it's right, but I understand why people do that. And then once you – but if you establish that line, that all-or-nothing line, do you just leave the people behind, the people that are behind the curve like you're talking about? Do you leave them behind or is part of your mission in moving forward to be able to try to bring some of those people over, even if it's a little at a time, right? Well, yeah, and I think some people would say, well, I'll bring them over, but what they really just did was build a giant wall and said they have to climb up and over it or tunnel under it or break through it or somehow. We, they gotta well, or, or that person doesn't necessarily build a wall, but certainly people in the community do that make it harder for the people because you've got people that are ushering folks, right? Oh, I'm, I'm that, talking about from one to the other. The person who would say, sure, they can join me, right? They're not, in other words, they're not saying, well, if you believe in, you know, magazine capacity restrictions right now, you can mm -hmm. never be here. But, but if you change your mind, I'll let you be part of our club, right? Right. And the problem is they're not doing anything to, to change their mind. really educate or advocate or bring the person. Right. Because part of that to me is also you have to kind of get out to the range and see the people shooting all around you with the with 30, 40, 50 round magazines and say, oh, yeah, right. that's a family of three. That guy's getting ready for a competition. You know, that, that guy's a cop. And then, oh, I see, but his wife's using the same exact magazine and the same gun for home defense training. And you start to see that it's not maybe whatever yep. you thought it was. You know what I mean? Yep. So, yeah. but, but again, if you draw the line, you know, you can't even come to our gun range unless you sign this form that says no restrictions whatsoever. And I think that's, you know, another thing I want to I ask you about. Um, and this might be putting you on the spot a little bit. I don't know, but, but I think, I think you're a big boy. You can handle it. Um, yeah. I, the problem I have with the all or nothing guys is that a lot of the all or nothing guys are people who are filling out 44 73s. They have FFLs, <laughs> right? They have NFA right. items. They fill right. out the SOT. So it's like, wait a minute, you're, you're will not comply while you're complying. I don't understand it. The, mm -hmm. the, I don't know very many people who will actually say it's, they may say they may couch it. They may say, "Well, the Constitution yeah. says no infringements." But but if pushed to it, really, you want machine guns, inventing machines in the grammar school with no that loaded well, ready. But that's what you want. Are you really no restrictions? <laughs> How do you deal with with that? Well, the the beauty is that you you don't really have to get that crazy with it. You go back to what you just said: mm -hmm. shall not comply. But yet you filled out a 4473 before, or you do on a regular basis. You have a license to carry or you know something of that nature. Mad props to those people that have purchased from individuals, whatever they have their entire life. There's no track record, no paperwork, nothing else, because I don't fall into that category in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And the vast majority of gunners, I don't think, fall into that category. So mad props if you're able to, to, to the full extent of life, enjoy your Second Amendment rights by not having to comply with, with certain things. Mad props to you for doing that, first of all. Um, but, yeah, I think 
I think there's even a subsection of that. A lot of the people that draw that line, you know, the three percent that shall not be infringed, nothing, you know, not not one inch, right, from my cold dead hands. And then you've got a subsection of that that as long as it's current regulation and law, it's fine, right? In other words, I'm okay. I hear, I hear it all the time. I'm okay with the 4473, and it's like, okay, for me, and this is my my. I I don't think the 4473 does anything, right? It should it should go away. I completely believe that, but at the same time that I believe it should go away, I can also because I want to utilize my Second Amendment right, and that's the way you do it. So I'm buying and utilizing firearms for fun and sport and any other legal means necessary uh, or any other legal means out there, um, it's it's a necessary evil that I have to do for now until we can potentially roll that back, right? So, um, so this gets to my, my – I believe, and I've been pushing this a lot lately because I, I think it's incredibly important as this will not comply – shall not comply line becomes more common as, as one mm -hmm. of the talking points or cliches in our community. I think it's important to point out there is a huge difference between compromise and compliance. Yes, so the way I look absolutely. at it is this, like people, well, people hit me like, well, you're old. You've been, you've been compromising for 20 years. Well, I've never said I'm okay with a 4473. I've never <laughs> said I'm okay. Right. I didn't vote for it. Yeah. I haven't gone into a room and said, I'll trade you background no. checks for constitutional carry. That's a right. compromise. Now I'm complying, right? And in complying, I understand that that's, a, we can talk about complying, but don't come at me with compromise because right. I never said this was okay. And people need to understand there is a huge difference well, between compliance and agreeing that it's okay. And, and that, that's me being a compromise. And there's also a certain amount of clout and experience that comes with compliance, right? So if you go out and you're, you're trying to utilize your Second Amendment rights to your fullest extent, and good Lord, I've got to comply with this, and I've got to comply with this, and what a pain in the neck. And that, yeah. that makes you even more vehemently against those things, right? You're like, this legislation sucks. Look at all this stuff I've got to go through as a law-abiding citizen, don't have a criminal history, nothing else. Look at all the crap I've got to go through just to go have some fun on the range on a Saturday. How ridiculous is this, right? If you if you say oh, I'm not taking part in any of this, I'm out. I don't want any of that. I don't want you have none of that experience to fall back on to then be able to identify with other people, which is what we talked about at the first, right? To be able to explain to them when maybe they talk about going to the Rangers, they're talking about forty four seventy C's, and you go, yeah, isn't it a pain in the neck having to fit it, fill out a form every single time you go in and buy a firearm, a form that the ATF doesn't collect and keep, by the way. So what's the point of that? You know. And they're like, you know what? You're right. I never thought of it that way. And you know what? You've moved them one step closer from a firearm owner to starting to think about advocacy and activism because you have experience with the stupid compliance that we have to do. And, and they do too. They want to order, you know, I see you all the time in like California. I, I can't order, you mean I can't order ammo online, but some guy in Texas can. Well, yep, that, that, that's what we're talking about. We've got state laws. Right. But like, this is a perfect example, right? Like, this is, this is pretty, right? Would you like me to give this to you? Yeah, I can't give it to you. Sure. Like that, this is a, it would be a, it would be a felony for me to take this gun that I made for my individual use on a 3D printer. I can't mm -hmm. give it to my daughter, right? right. Because it's not. Now I can go. I can put it under my manufacturer's license. I can go to Florida, print a gun out, put it under the Vidity Arms manufacturing license, put a serial number on it, put it in the book that says we made this. And then mm -hmm. I could transfer it to her as a gift, right? And obviously, when she's the right age. So, so th these uh, that, but that is convoluted, right? And people don't yeah. get what universal background checks mean when they say it. That it means yeah. I can't give my daughter a gift, right? So, so I think right. you're right. I think that that is a valid point. We've got like maybe three minutes left. Um, ATF does collect them, obtain them when an FFL goes out of business. Yeah. So, so I mean, there is there is a. Um, I I understand the point of it's. Not a federal well, there's registry. there's federal regula there's federal regulation though, and and we can we can argue conspiracy theory if somebody wants to argue that I, I'm it's not the time or place, but they there's legislation that yes they do collect them unless that FFL there are options for an FFL to pass those on to another FFL they can do several things with them it's not mandatory that they're collected first of all they're put in storage and there's no registry being created by the stuff that's turned in, and there's legislation that says they cannot do that. Yeah, I, I, again, I don't want to go too far off in the weeds because it's definitely yeah. off topic here. 
Um, I understand your point that it, it's there are there are there's value in going through this process and mm -hmm. learning just how ridiculous it is in a lot of ways. Um, right. I didn't see any particular questions come up, so yeah, my good lord, with, don't even you know don't even get started with NFA, right? Like, well, no, we, we can't. We're not. Going to I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, no, no. I'm just I'm just putting it out there for anybody that might be listening nope. that nope. you want to okay. get into crazy. That's crazy town. So it is. It is all. All of it is. I think the problem is we, as gun guys, will go there really fast. Mm -hmm. And it sort of entertains the point um, that I think a lot of this series is trying to work against, which is stop worrying about what we know or we care about, and let's worry right. about what that other person knows or what they care about, and, and meet them where they are. As you said, yeah. listen to them where they are, hear them where they are. We want them to be where we are, but it can't be because they climbed a wall jumped a fiery pit, you know, waded through shark infested rivers. And then they got there on their own and just magically showed up wearing the, the snake shirt and, and waving the flag and mola and lave and all that. It just doesn't work that yeah. way. No. So, and I appreciate your, uh, your contribution to the series and uh, your, your passionate, um, constant, um, what I see as constant efforts to get people uh, to, to hear these messages. And as you said, messages from other people, you know, I, I remember a couple years ago sitting there, you know, in and out of the room, they're in GRPC, whether I'm speaking or I'm listening to somebody I want to speak or I'm just in there because, you know, I'm there to hear whoever's up there. And mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, I think 47 hours a day with your, you know. I don't know. Just, live stream. Right. I think the entire right. thing, like, almost the entire thing we live yeah. streamed. Yeah. So, so just the fact that you're doing that kind of stuff and uh, you just recently, I know, uh, had a great conversation with uh, Laura Smith at Liberal Gun Club to get her message out because there are so mm -hmm. many people that will tell us, you know, well, you can't change anybody's mind and liberals don't care about guns and you're never going to get any Democrats to change their mind or whatever. New newbies, uh, compliers, spuds, that. And I'm telling you, no, we need them all. Um, if you're not anti-gun, you are a lot better than being anti-gun and you're closer yeah. to me. So that's Well, it. And, and all of those you just mentioned, that's a box. That's one of yep. the conversations I had with Laura and, and I don't think I said it during that podcast, but I'm like, there's four boxes that I understand. The soap box, the ballot box, the cartridge box, and the pine box. Outside of that, <laughs> leave the boxes alone. I don't want any more boxes. That's enough. That's all we I need. listened to that. I listened to that uh, this morning. I think it was like it was like ninety minutes long. I listened to it this morning. You did say that, man. I appreciate what you do. Tell everybody where to find you for more information. Uh, CloverTech.com. You can hit up the social media carousel there because I'm I'm literally everywhere. So follow whichever social media platforms you're poison. Go there. Hit up that social media carousel and uh, yeah, follow wherever you would like to follow. Do you have anything to say to the people? <laughs> All right. So we're going we're to move on with our day, man. I appreciate it. Again, this yeah. is going to be posted uh, at my YouTube channel. It'll be on Instagram. But more importantly, it's going to be coming out through the Second Amendment organization blog. So I'm going to cut out the, uh, the high hello, especially before Christopher got on there. We got started pretty quick. Uh, make sure that you're following 2AO.org. Um, we are all about grassroots advocacy and empowering people to do it in a way that we think is better. And it's not just the way I think is better, but it's influenced by guys like you, Christopher. Thank you for your work, man. Yeah.